very interesting and special about uh, this region is uh, increasing uh, regional economic integration. So I'd like to focus my talk on that subject and then come back to Japan's uh, economic policy, particularly foreign economic policy, uh, focusing on Asia. And then I have some concluding remarks. Uh, one of the messages that I'd like to get across is this. Uh, Japan is uh, still, uh, I would say, suffering from low economic growth. And in order for, you know, recover and to regain its uh, competitiveness and to get back on uh, growth trajectory, uh, we need to do several things. One of them is to open up our economy further. Uh, and one of the ways, one of the best ways to do so is to get involved in uh, mega FTAs, which uh, Ambassador Hong Ken Yong referred to, like TPP, RCP, which stands for Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in East Asia, uh, and so on. Uh, and so, uh, again, uh, the message I'd like to get across to you is that Japan needs to undertake a uh, 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 very important strategy which focus on opening up our economy and also uh, carrying out uh, 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 domestic reform, which has to go uh, uh, jointly. Okay. Now, uh, what I do is the following. I'd like to uh, go over these points or messages that I, I'd like to uh, uh, indicate first, and then I'll have some figure, figures and tables uh, to support some of my points which I make. Uh, first, uh, as I said before, Japan is still in the uh, low economic growth mode. Uh, since the, uh, the uh, uh, collapse of a bubble in the early 1990s, the uh, Japanese economy was going through a, a period of long, long uh, recession. Okay? And one of the uh, uh, symptoms was the deflation, which is uh, very unusual as far as I understand. If you look into like uh, economics textbook, um, I don't see any chapter which discuss this uh, deflation. Uh, so this is such an unusual situation. Okay? But Japan is still uh, in this deflationary mo mode. And uh, having said this, uh, since uh, Prime Minister Abe came back into his office in uh, 2012, uh, the, our economy was uh, coming back, uh, but not in a full speed, but it's, it is coming back. Uh, so the issue is how to really uh, uh, recover or regain uh, our competitiveness or our dynamism to get on the medium to long term uh, uh, economic growth. One of the uh, problems is a shortage of demand, which uh, I'll talk about later. Uh, these are somewhat short term problems. Uh, maybe more serious problems are, which I call structural problems, uh, declining and aging population, uh, and we are experiencing declining savings rate, uh, in increasing government debt, and as I emphasized earlier, uh, our economy is still closed compared to uh, uh, many countries, of course, including Singapore, which is a very open economy. Uh, and uh, we still have uh, heavily regulated sectors. Uh, and so these are some of the serious uh, structural problems that we have to deal with, okay? Now, how can we uh, get out of this uh, problem and then to achieve uh, economic growth? Uh, the important, I think, point is productivity. Uh, the reason why I say productivity is important is this. Uh, uh, it sounds like a maybe economics one lecture. Uh, in order to achieve economic growth, there are three ways to do it from supply side. 
uh, one is to increase labor inputs, uh, another one is to increase in capital inputs, and the third one is increase productivity. Japan cannot really expect increasing labor inputs unless Japan uh, uh, accept foreign workers or, or immigrants, uh, which uh, is a very difficult problem at the moment. Uh, and so we cannot expect much from increasing in labor inputs in order to achieve economic growth. Uh, what about the increase in capital inputs? That's another uh, 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 way to achieve economic growth. Uh, as I said, and I, I'll show you later, our savings rate is declining quite, quite sharply. Uh, under such si situation, it is very difficult to get a source of investment unless we attract investment from foreign countries. Okay, so that's a challenge. And so what we are left with is the increase in productivity. And that's why I said, uh, I, I, I write here, uh, one of the major challenges for J Japanese economy is to increase productivity. And uh, looking at the economic growth from demand side, you can, incre you can achieve economic growth by increasing consumption, uh, investment, and exports, okay? Uh, here I'd like to uh, kind of focus on is exports and maybe investment. Uh, so uh, if Japan can successfully expand their exports to a uh, growing region uh, of the world, which is Asia Pacific, then that will help Japan to get back on uh, growth strategy, okay? I mean growth uh, trajectory, okay? And uh, so these are the challenges and how can we, over how can we meet the challenges? Uh, my uh, 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 proposition here is this, to implement structural reforms and also to undertake new foreign economic policy focusing on Asia. Now I'll show you some of the figures. Uh, here uh, we are looking at the growth rates of uh, uh, Japan, China, US, and East Asian Pacific uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, Yes, uh, Japan is the one uh, at the bottom. Uh, uh, this is starts in 1990 or 1989. The reason why I chose 1989 uh, is this is the year when the uh, APEC was uh, established. Uh, and Japan was uh, growing very, uh, at a low rate. And uh, this is a global financial crisis period. And this is the uh, uh, Asian financial crisis period. So. Japan it was doing very, has been doing very badly in uh, terms of economic growth, particularly uh, compared to a country like China. Uh, GDP, uh, this is in nominal terms. Uh, in 1990, here, yeah, uh, Japan's GDP in this U.S. dollars, nominal U.S. dollars, is about four or five times as large as that of China. But by 2010, China surpassed Japan. And then now, uh, as far as I know, in 2014, uh, China's uh, GDP is almost like uh, twice or close to maybe three times as that of Japan, but partly because of uh, exchange rate. As uh, you may know, uh, Japan's exchange rate, yen dollar rate, depreciated quite substantially uh, since uh, Prime Minister Abe took his office. Uh, now, uh, it used to be like uh, uh, 75 yen to a dollar. Now it's about 120 yen to a dollar. Uh, just, you know, taking into account of this change in exchange rate will give Japanese GDP a low uh, figure because this is measured in U.S. dollars. Okay, but still, having said this, uh, you can see uh, Japan's GDP in nominal terms, in U.S. nominal terms, uh, uh, flat over the, over like 20 year period. Uh, so this is the uh, situation. Now deflation or inflation, of course, uh, you know, deflation is here. Uh, we have many years of deflation. And of course, when you ask, uh, uh, say, consumers, uh, you know, deflation, uh, they say this is good because prices are going down. Uh, but if uh, you can keep your income, 
uh, yes, uh, given the, inc the same amount of income uh, with deflation, you can purchase more. But this is really unhealthy uh, situation as far as I'm concerned. Uh, particularly if you look at the company, uh, you know, they uh, say uh, consider in their, say, like uh, uh, constructing their future plan uh, or thinking about investment, they will make a forecast, you know, what will happen in the Japanese market in the future. If the deflation is continue, then sales will not go up or maybe even go down. Under such circumstances, companies do not really invest in Japan. They invest in other countries like, you know, Southeast Asia possibly. But anyway, so this is a situation, a very uh, unusual uh, situation. Uh, now, turning to the structural problems. Here, uh, we are looking at Japan's uh, demographic uh, uh, landscape or s uh, picture here. Uh, this shows the number of population, the size of population. Uh, our population growth rate uh, became negative around 2007. And then since then, uh, population, absolute number is declining. And if this trend, past trend continues into the future, we'll, ex well, we'll s expect uh, our population to go below 100,000. Currently it's 120,000, I mean 120 million, I'm sorry, 120 million. And then by 2048 or so, our population will go down uh, below 100 million. Uh, and, bes and in addition to that, the this aging is a population is a uh, uh, problem. Uh, and uh, if again, if the current uh, trend or past trend continued into the future, by 2048 uh, or 2050, one out of three uh, persons will be 65 years or older, which is a very aging society. Now, I talked about savings rate. Here, uh, we see the change in gross savings to GNP, or sorry, GI, uh, gross national income, which is very close to gross national product, okay? Uh, Japan's uh, uh, ratio is declining over time. Uh, U.S., it's very well known that the U.S. has been uh, registering very low savings rate. Uh, but what is uh, uh, notable here is a decline of savings rate uh, in, for Japan. And by contrast, uh, East Asia and China, uh, and I know in Singapore, uh, uh, savings rate is like 50% still. So uh, as I said earlier, in order to invest, uh, which will result in economic growth in the future, you need savings, but we cannot, Japan cannot expect savings uh, from domestic sources to support investment. Um, what about the government? The government can help economy by uh, increasing their expenditure, but Japan, Japanese government have done that for so many years. Now government debt to GDP ratio is uh, far higher uh, compared to uh, the corresponding ratios for the country like Italy. Uh, I don't have uh, like Greece or Portugal here, but uh, their numbers are below uh, the numbers of Japan. So Japanese government uh, is uh, uh, in debt, uh, in, de in deep debt. Here, let me just one, make one remark. You know, in Europe, Greece and other countries are in trouble, uh, and Japan so far is not in trouble as far as government debt pro problem is concerned. Uh, the reason is that Japanese government is debt to Japanese population, whereas uh, Greece or these European countries, they have debt against uh, 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 foreign countries. So uh, unless Japanese people decide to move their savings out of Japan to foreign countries, uh, Japanese government or Japanese society or Japanese economy 
doesn't have to worry about this debt problem so much. Um, yes, I talked ab uh, about the closeness of, of, of the Japanese economy. Here I look at trade, international trade to GDP ratio first, and then next I like to look at the uh, international investment or foreign direct investment to GDP ratio. Here uh, we are looking at the uh, trade to GDP ratio. Here trade means exports plus imports, okay? Um, well, Singapore by far is well known. Uh, this, ra this ratio is very high. And Malaysia and some of the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, Japan, well, the numbers are similar uh, to those for Indonesia and China, uh, lower compared to uh, Korea, but the same as the U.S. So as far as trade uh, GDP ratio is concerned, uh, Japan, yes, very low, but not maybe uh, much lower than other countries. But what is uh, interesting is this, foreign direct investment to GDP ratio. One in blue is the outward foreign direct investment. This is like a, uh, Singaporean companies setting up their, say, base or factories in Vietnam, for example. That's a foreign direct investment. Uh, Singapore uh, uh, it has been very successful in attracting foreign investment. Uh, here, as you see, uh, uh, this uh, uh, bar in orange. Okay, uh, so compared to other countries or compared to uh, outward direct investment, Japan has not been successfully attracting uh, investment from foreign countries. That's the problem. You know, you combine the fact that the savings rate in Japan is low or getting lower, and you're not successful in getting uh, 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 investment from foreign countries, that is called foreign savings. Uh, uh, Japan uh, uh, is, in a, in, is in trouble because there's shortage of resources for investment. So one big challenge for Abe administration is to increase foreign direct investment uh, inward. And indeed, I was uh, chair of this uh, committee which looked into the problems. This is for the cabinet office that they set up this committee. And I happened to be asked to chair this uh, uh, committee, again, to look into the reasons why we are not successful in uh, attracting foreign direct investment. Um, Regulations, yes, but maybe not so different than other countries. But one of the uh, interesting findings is this. Uh, like education or maybe language is one. Singapore is very, uh, again, successful in attracting FDI for many reasons. You know. uh, one reason, I think, is a very international society. English is spoken very open to foreign uh, uh, people. Uh, in Japan, although uh, there's a desire for Japanese government, even for Japanese people, uh, to be, uh, for, uh, for them to become uh, uh, attractive to foreign people, but again, English is not much spoken. Uh, uh, that's one of the problems. And then education system. Particularly, you know, if you're uh, interested in attracting foreign companies, uh, of course they bring in uh, uh, personnel from head office, and they worry about their children's education. We don't have many international schools. Uh, that's one reason. Another reason that I remember quite interesting is this. Uh, when foreign, um, particularly Westerners, come to, foreign, to Japan, they come with their course uh, spouses and they want their spouse to work uh, but uh, uh, getting a work permit for spouses is not easy in Japan so these are you know regu uh, regu I mean uh, restriction regulations which need to be changed but so uh, these are some of the problems that Japan is faced with now yes this is the one right sorry uh, here I just wanted to show uh, to whom, with whom that we trade with. And the point is, uh, others meaning uh, non-APEC uh, economies. Uh, so uh, the rest is APEC economies. Uh, about 80% of our exports go to APEC economies. 
60, uh, about 60 percent of imports come from APEC economy. So we, our, our international trade, Japan's international trade depends very much on APEC economies. Here, yeah, sorry uh, for this uh, very uh, kind of fine, too fine, uh, uh, no letters. Uh, the point here is that large portion of export, our exports go to uh, East Asia. Uh, and imports come from East Asia. This is the point that I wanted to make. And here, uh, uh, this shows the overseas sales of Japanese firms. A large proportion of overseas sales come from East Asia. So here, point is that Japan uh, depends very much on uh, Asia Pacific, particularly Asia, uh, uh, in their uh, foreign trade as well as in foreign direct investment. Now, uh, let me turn to the next subject. Uh, this is the uh, economic integration in this uh, region, Asia Pacific. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, re relatively new phenomenon. And uh, first, uh, there's this regionalization which is driven by markets. And then, uh, more recently, uh, regional economic integration has been driven by institutions such as free trade agreements. Uh, such as, uh, 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 I guess, uh, free trade agreements is one of the most important one. I guess uh, there are other uh, regional uh, initiatives, such as, you know, Chenma Initiative, which is to deal with the uh, uh, currency swap. So regionalism or regionalization is taking place in East Asia recently. Uh, East Asia is uh, uh, has been achieving rapid economic growth as we saw earlier on the slide, okay? And uh, uh, what are the important factors which led to high economic growth? I'd say uh, uh, foreign trade, uh, expansion of foreign trade and foreign direct investment. And that uh, in turn led to uh, increasing inter-regional trade, inter-regional foreign direct investment, particularly uh, in the sectors such as electronics or automobile and machinery. Uh, and uh, behind this uh, regional, regional uh, uh, you know, regionalization, very interesting strategies undertaken by multinationals called fragmentation strategy. That is to break up the production process into various processes and then locate each one of these processes in a country or the region where that particular uh, process can be done most efficiently at the least cost. That strategy has been uh, implemented by many uh, multinationals, and which led to the formation of uh, uh, supply chains or global value chains. Okay? And I argue uh, liberalization of trade and FDI policy contributed a lot to uh, such development, that is regional regionalization, uh, fragmentation strategy, and so on. Okay, now uh, this shows you the increasing importance of trade and foreign direct investment for APEC economies. Uh, the, uh, these lines show, the one on top shows, again, trade to GDP ratio, which increased from about 20% to 40%. Uh, this one is uh, direct investment inward stock to GDP ratio. Uh, this increased also from about 10 to 10 percent to 25 or close to 30 percent. Okay. And uh, sorry about these uh, small letters. Uh, Intra-regional trade ratio indicates the share of intra-regional trade, that is say, uh, trade among APEC economies, uh, uh, and proportion of that to total trade. Okay. Uh, for APEC. Uh, economies that ratio is very high. About 65 percent of APEC economies trade is done within uh, with, with uh, other APEC economies. Uh, the number uh, uh, gets lower if we uh, focus on East Asia, but it's about 50 percent. Uh, lower than EU, but higher than NAFTA, which of NAFTA of course stands for North uh, American free trade area uh, or free trade agreements, 
uh, which involves uh, U.S., Canada, and Mexico, okay? So, and this graph shows you increasing share of parts and components in total trade or interregional trade. For East Asia, about 18% to 30%. Uh, what does this mean? That this means uh, fragmentation uh, or, or global uh, value chains have been developed in this region because they actively trade parts and components rather than finished products. Because uh, by trading parts and components between among these uh, 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 affiliates of foreign multinationals, uh, they, uh, uh, in they increase uh, trade in parts and components. Okay? So this shows how production network has been developed in this region. Uh, what are the reasons uh, behind such development? As I said earlier, uh, trade liberalization and liberalization in foreign direct investment policy contributed a lot. And here we are looking at trade liberalization. Uh, look at the, uh, uh, these are average tar tariff rates for all these countries. Uh, for total product, if you look at China, uh, in 1992, uh, average tariff rate uh, for total products uh, for China was as high as 40 percent, but that number came down to below 10 uh, in 2010. So it's a huge drop in tariff rates. Of course, that means trade, was trade policy was liberalized. A similar uh, trend can be found for other countries, although the magnitude uh, may be much lower than that of China. So these are the one of the reasons uh, which led to increased trade and FDI liberalization led to increasing foreign direct investment. And in, in addition, we can maybe add um, such factors as uh, technological progress in transporta transportation services, uh, deregulation in you know, uh, transportation and communication services, uh, which led to the a decline in the cost of transportation and cost of communication, which in turn uh, contributed to increasing trade and FDI. Now, uh, turning to uh, institutional uh, driven uh, regionalization, here are FTAs, free trade agreements. Free trade agreements, uh, I think you, most of you know what that is. That is to uh, liberalize trade uh, between and among FTA members, so it's a limited geographical coverage. The maybe most uh, uh, well-known one in this uh, region may be ASEAN Free Trade Area, uh, which uh, was established in 1992. So this is the uh, uh, free trade area covering now 10 countries. At that time, uh, six countries, okay? Uh, and one important, uh, I think, uh, factor or characteristic of the uh, FTA is a discrimin discriminatory trade policy because you give preference to uh, FTA members, but you do not give this preferential treatment, that is a liberalization, to non-members. So this is discriminatory. Um, now, Coming back to East Asia as a whole, uh, we have uh, ASEAN plus one. Uh, maybe this is uh, better to look at. Uh, this is a situation in Asia Pacific, uh, region-wide FTAs in East Asia, and I should say Pacific. Uh, I was going to say this ASEAN plus one FTA. Plus one means ASEAN and China, ASEAN and Japan, ASEAN and Korea, ASEAN India, ASEAN and Australia and New Zealand in the order of uh, 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 year of establishment, okay? So there are five ASEAN plus one FTAs. Uh, one important uh, uh, point here is ASEAN is a hub of these five FTAs. And now Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCP or RCEP, uh, has been under negotiation 
uh, since 2013. And their target uh, for concluding this uh, uh, negotiation is the end of this year. Uh, it's not, I'm not sure whether that can be done, but at least that is a target. Uh, it's very maybe likely that to be delayed, but again, uh, they just had maybe 10th round. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they had 10th round of negotiation very recently. And that Im uh, RCEP, of course, involves 10 ASEAN countries and plus six, India, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, okay? So this is the, uh, uh, what we call mega, one of mega FTAs. And this is a mega FTA in East Asia. Uh, uh, in addition, we have China, Japan, Korea, we call them CJK, FTA and the negotiation. Uh, partly because of, may, maybe mainly, or partly because of political problem between Japan and China and Japan, Korea, uh, negotiation has been moving, has not been moving smoothly. Uh, and if we look at the other side of uh, Pacific, of course, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, uh, is under negotiation involving 12 countries, including Singapore and Japan. Now, uh, many people expected that they could reach a so-called overall uh, uh, agreement uh, in July, uh, but they failed. Uh, and they just had, they, uh, uh, one of the issues was Japan-US uh, negotiation. Uh, they can agree on several things, including rice and other agriculture products. That is uh, Japan's import. And then automobile. You know, maybe I'll come back to these issues later. Okay, anyway, uh, TPP is under negotiation. Uh, and then uh, one on here is FTAAP, which stands for Free Trade Area of Asia Pacific. Uh, this is considered to be a venture eventual goal of regionalization in APEC uh, economies. Uh, but uh, China was uh, very active in pursuing this uh, FTAAP uh, kind of strategy. Uh, but now there's no uh, formal negotiations uh, yet to begin. Uh, so mega FTAs, I already um, talked about TPP, RCP, but here I, I make some points, uh, important points about uh, these two mega FTAs. And I, I think I already mentioned many of these. Uh, I think I, I did. Uh, and one point I wanted to emphasize is the competition between mega FTAs, in this case, RCEP and TPP. And there's another important mega FTA which has been negotiated between US and EU. That is tra uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It's called TTIP, T-T-I-P. So there are three big mega FTAs under negotiation at the moment, okay? Uh, and they put pressure on each other. They compete uh, each other. Uh, and I already mentioned the FTAP, Free Trade Area of Asia Pacific. That's a long-term goal of regional economic integration. And to achieve this FTAP, uh, their uh, APEC leaders agreed that uh, there are two so-called pathways uh, to reach uh, FTAP. One is TPP, the other is uh, RCEP. Uh, what are the similarities or differences between TPP and RCEP? TPP's coverage very comprehensive, not only trade liberalization, investment liberalization, but you know uh, intellectual property rights, uh, regulatory coherence, competitiveness, SME, small and medium uh, size enterprise policies, and so on. Uh, and also, they uh, uh, attempt, they achieve, they try to. Uh, um, they tried to uh, uh, establish a very open area by eliminating all the types. That's their objective, uh, but it's a very difficult objective to achieve. But in a TPP, is so-called 21st century platinum standard uh, arrangement because of this. 
comprehensiveness, and high level of liberalization. Whereas RCEP is a limited, more limited coverage. Uh, although many of the items are very much the same, but the level of like openness, level of liberalization, uh, level of coverage is uh, limited. Uh, one important uh, point in RCEP is this is not uh, like TPP, which is a legalistic arrangement. RCEP uh, is uh, uh, RCEP uh, negotiating members uh, like to see RCEP as a framework to provide assistance to developing countries like you know, uh, Cambodia, um, uh, Laos, uh, and Myanmar, it's called CLM, maybe Vietnam included sometimes. Uh, uh, and one important difference between TPP and RCEP is the country uh, coverage. TPP does, or APEC, or TPP, right? Uh, do they do not have Cambodia, Laos PDR, Myanmar, or India, uh, whereas RCEP does. TPP doesn't have China. RCEP doesn't have the United States. And because of these different country coverage, uh, some observers like to contrast these two frameworks as China versus US. Maybe there's some element, but from the point of view of economics, I don't see that kind of uh, 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 you know, approach or the view uh, may not be so appropriate. But anyway, so there are some differences. Uh, objectives is to establish high standard uh, regional agreements and so on. They are very similar, okay? Uh, expected, expected impacts of FDAs, because uh, uh, trade and FDI will be liberalized, uh, and that will lead to, expected to uh, uh, promote economic growth. And if FDAs can uh, uh, promote structural reforms, domestic reforms, uh, then that will add more, uh, 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 I mean, that will even, in, uh, that would even promote uh, uh, further economic growth. So we can, we should, and we can expect economic growth from FTAs. Now, uh, let me quickly cover this subject, Japan's foreign economic policy in Asia Pacific. I already told you that Japan is interested in expanding their uh, uh, international relationship with uh, fast-growing East Asia and, uh, and uh, Asia Pacific uh, by expanding exports, by increasing uh, investment, and particularly Japan is interested in exporting global infrastructure um, like rail or railway system, not just the you know railway uh, 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 trains and so on. It's not just the hard so-called infrastructure. Uh, but soft infrastructure, which includes the system, how to run transportation, uh, and so on. So Japan is very much keen on expanding their exports of infrastructure to particularly East Asian uh, countries. Although Japanese agriculture uh, sector, on average, is not as competitive as other agriculture sectors in other countries, but some of the agriculture products are, s do seem to be quite competitive. So if that's the case, uh, uh, Japan, Japanese government is interested in expanding their ar uh, agriculture products, okay? And as I said earlier, Japan is interested in attracting foreign direct investment and also at interested in attracting high-skilled personnel. I guess this is uh, uh, <coughs> This is a kind of uh, objective or uh, uh, you know goal of uh, many countries attracting high skilled personnel, and also attracting foreign tourists is another uh, item which Japanese government is very interested in. And thanks to uh, depreciation of yen, uh, we have been Japan has been very successful in attracting foreign tourists. It's much much cheaper now to travel to Japan, or maybe at least inside Japan. Uh, it used to be, you know, uh, 75 yen to a dollar. It's about 120 yen to a dollar. So you can stay in Japanese hotel at maybe 60% of what you had to say, <laughs> spend, you know, uh, uh, before. So uh, uh, 
this year anyway, uh, Japan has been very successful in attracting foreign tourists. Uh, and uh, Abenomics, uh, which was adopted, uh, formulated, and implemented by uh, Prime Minister Abe when he came into office, uh, consists of three called arrows, uh, aggressive monetary policy, flexible fiscal uh, spending, and then growth strategy. And uh, growth strategy consists of various uh, uh, items, components, now, one of the important components is FTAs, uh, particularly TPP and RCP. Uh, and, we, and they add also Japan-EU FTA, which is under negotiation. And they expect these uh, FTAs uh, to uh, facilitate, uh, to achieve, facilitate, uh, 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 I mean, it makes it easier for Japan to achieve these goals, such as attracting FDI, such as exporting infrastructure, and so on, okay? Uh, current state of Japan's FTAs, you know, we have quite a few FTAs, in number anyway, but not as many as those of uh, Singapore, I guess. Uh, so we have 14 FTAs, and we can see the list here. Uh, what is uh, important, let's say first, uh, motives, yes. Uh, th these motives are pretty much the same for other FTAs or for other countries. Expand exports, e expand uh, uh, investment, and so on. But for Japan, obtaining energy and, and natural resources is another objective. Promote structural reforms in Japan, improve a good relationship with other countries, uh, and also uh, through FTA, Japan is interested in providing economic assistance to developing countries. Now, uh, this uh, graph shows you the proportion of trade uh, down with FTA partners in total trade. Uh, here, Singapore is quite high, 60%. 60% of Singapore's trade is down with, conducted with FTA members, okay? What about Japan? Less than 20%. So. Uh, according to Prime Minister Abe's office, uh, if we can successfully uh, conclude all these agreements which are under negotiation, uh, FTA coverage ratio for Japan in go up to about 75 to 80 percent. That's what the uh, Abe administration is interested in. Okay. Here, uh, this table may not be so easy to read. Uh, this, uh, these numbers show so-called FTA tra trade liberalization ratio. Uh, this is a proportion of, say, uh, traded items, okay? Uh, proportion of uh, so-called tariff lines or number of products which, whose tariffs are to be eliminated, okay? Thanks to FTA divided by total number of products. So for Japan, uh, Japan, the Philippine FTA, Japan committed itself, committed itself to remove tariffs on 88% of all the products. Uh, these numbers seem quite high, but if you compare the corresponding numbers for other FTAs, like Australia, US, Australia committed itself to remove tariffs on all the products, 100%, okay? And I don't have the figures here, but if I remember correctly, for Singapore, you have 100% elimination commitment for many, if not all, F your FTAs. So the point here is that Japan has difficulty in opening up some sectors, here, agriculture. And that's a problem for Japan in order to pursue active FTA policy. Okay. Uh, here, what can we expect from TPP uh, as far as Jap Japanese economy is concerned? According to, there are some you know, uh, estimates coming from simulation exercise. Uh, Japan's cabinet office, the government office came, came up with this number, 0.66% of GDP. But uh, researchers, this, uh, the second one, Petri, 
Flamma and Zai. This is a study done by these three uh, economists. Uh, these uh, numbers are very, much, very often referred to. According to them, uh, TPP would increase Japan's GDP by 2%, which is quite, quite, quite substantial. Remember the growth rate of Japan, you know, 0%, 1%. So considering these low economic growth rate, uh, this 2%, even 0.66% is quite large. So uh, that's, this is one of the reasons that we should, Japan should uh, be active in uh, concluding TPP negotiation. Uh, but, but there are obstacles, okay? Uh, opposition come from uh, mainly agriculture sector in Japan. They oppose to uh, any FTAs, of course, including TPP, and the reasons are the following. Uh, if we open up agriculture sector, uh, uh, imported uh, agriculture products come in, that will, that will reduce uh, so-called self-sufficiency uh, ratio in food supply in Japan. Of course, that might happen. And uh, if uh, uh, increased imports will lead to reduction in Japanese production of agriculture, they argue that will have a negative impact on environment because having rice field uh, uh, maintain, you know, having ri uh, rice field can really maintain a uh, uh, natural environment according to them. And if the agriculture sector in the rural area is cut back, again, according to them, that will have a damage on the local economy. Um, these points may be correct, but uh, uh, in my view, they are overprotective. I mean, if we need the protection, we can do much better, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but I think the final uh, point, which is very important, is uh, real uh, opposition. Real opposition comes from uh, uh, these vested interest groups. In the case of Japan, agriculture cooperatives they are very influential uh, in political uh, respect. And they are the, one of the groups who would like to maintain the status quo because they have vested interest, okay? This shows you a very interesting uh, phenomenon in Japan. Agriculture has been protected, as I said earlier, uh, what is peculiar or, or unusual or different uh, in the pattern of protection in Japan is that there are only few selected items which receive huge protection. On average, agriculture production rate uh, for Japan is lower than that of, say, Korea, Norway, Switzerland. These are, you know, agriculture uh, import uh, uh, countries, but here, uh, if you look at the one at the bottom, um, you may not know what uh, cognac potato is. Uh, this is, uh, you know, delicacy. If uh, you consume this, you, e you eat this in a small piece. Um, accord according to this estimate, uh, cognac potato receives a tariff which is equivalent to 1,700%, uh, which means uh, production cost in, of potato, uh, cognac potato in Japan is 17 times as high as that of international price. That's a huge protection. Uh, rice, 778%. Again, uh, huge protection. Peanuts uh, uh, and so on, okay? So uh, these are the problems. And then uh, political parties support protection of agriculture because of the support that they can get from farmers and farmers' cooperatives, okay? So uh, one interesting kind of uh, anecdote uh, is this. Cognac potato is grown in a prefecture called uh, Gumma Prefecture, which is about 100 kilometers north of Tokyo. And that prefecture, uh, special thing about this pre prefecture is that uh, Guma Prefecture produced four prime ministers in the last like 20 years. See, uh, that shows how politically 
influential that uh, uh, pref prefecture is, which of course is reflected in the very high protection given to this uh, cognac potato. Okay. All right. Uh, now, let me wrap up. Uh, I argued that Japan is in a very difficult situation uh, for achieving economic growth to regain competitiveness. Uh, what Japan needs to do is to open up uh, its economy and to implement structural reforms. Uh, and one uh, important uh, effective uh, way of doing so is to uh, uh, increase its interaction, economic interaction with Asia Pacific uh, and through uh, many, of course, instruments, including FDAs, particularly TPP, RCP, uh, important for Japan to uh, uh, achieve economic growth. Uh, because uh, WTO liberalization uh, negotiation has been stalled. Um, of course, ideally, WTO liberalization, can, if that can be done, that I think that's ideal, but since it, it, is, it seems to be difficult for WTO to move forward, uh, FDAs could be, uh, in, my, in my view, second best solution. Okay. Uh, And uh, so uh, TPP is the first one that we can conclude if uh, all the countries agree to do so. And if TPP fails, that will be a blow to many countries, of course, TPP negotiating countries, but particularly Japan and maybe United States. Uh, not for, I mean, partly because of maybe non-economic reasons, but the, uh, and for economic reasons, again, uh, TPP is a very important part of abenomics. If abenomics fails, then that will, have a, that will damage the Abe administration. So this is very important, okay? Um, and as a country uh, in the world, uh, Japan is as a, one of the, I guess, leading countries in the world, uh, Japan should try to uh, uh, achieve uh, liberalization in trade and investment uh, in the world, maybe through WTO. No, it's not Japan. It's in the, in the interest of Japan uh, to push not only TPP and RCEP and so on, but at the same time, we should try to really promote WTO negotiation. Okay, uh, final point, or uh, two uh, more points. One is, how can Japan uh, move forward in the FDA? How can Japan conclude FDAs despite uh, agriculture opposition? How can they overcome opposition from agriculture? Uh, one possible way, of course, is to provide safety net to those who may lose job. There will be people who may lose job because of FDA, because of TPP. The government uh, uh, has a responsibility to take care of these people by providing technical assistance, providing maybe temporary income compensation and so on. So with this safety net, it's easier to implement uh, trade liberalization under FDA. And finally, uh, it's not only Japan but other countries too, uh, need a strong political leadership uh, to promote FDAs, particularly TPP, because TPP faces a strong opposition from many uh, uh, circles of Japan. Uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation. Well, thank you very much for listening.